Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Welcome tonight to the beginning of our 19th season of the History Lecture Series at Nunez Community College. Yeah, that's okay, yeah. <laughs> My name is Katherine Lemoyne. I am the Director of Development here at Nunez Community College, and it is my honor to be your host here this evening. Tonight, we are in for a real treat, as we are all here tonight to celebrate the oldest business in St. Bernard Parish, the St. Bernard Voice. And with us here tonight to deliver this lecture is no stranger. Tonight we have someone who has written over 1,600 columns for the St. Bernard Voice, Mr. Ron Chapman. Ron Chapman has served as a professor of history at Nunez Community College for the last 18 years. He's an accomplished author, newspaper columnist, and historian. His lectures and his writings are a tribute to his knowledge, tenacity, research skills, and love for the special richness that is Louisiana history. It is my privilege and honor to turn the mic over to Mr. Ron Chapman. Greetings all. I want to open by thanking Catherine for such a wonderful job setting everything up. She's our new hostess and she's put the ball out the puck. So congratulations to you and your staff, love. Now the next order of business is seeing if the technology works, and it does. So we'll roll back. I've had the pleasure of working with the St. Bernard Voice now for 32 years. My experience started after the Home Rule Charter. It was written and I wanted the opportunity to explain it to the citizens, so I came to Mr. E.M., asked if I could write some articles explaining the charter. He said, sure. So I did, and when the charter passed, I thought that was the end. He said, you know, Ron, if you want to keep writing, feel free. I said, but on what? Is there anything you want? That was a dangerous move, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's been a pleasure. It really has been. And uh, with that, I'll begin talking about the St. Bernard Voice. 129 years, imagine that. Local newspapers, they're disappearing, and it's sad, because local newspapers have the local touch with the community and the people. They know what's going on, and they keep people informed of what's happening in their communities. And they're rapidly disappearing. They've always played such a vital role. If you go back in the colonial period, it was newspapers that projected the American Revolution. With these vital institutions disappearing, Communities are losing touch, not only with what happens on a daily basis, but in many ways with each other, because they predate the internet. They predate Facebook. That's where people used to communicate through these very important organs. And St. Bernard Voice has a proud tradition of 129 years of service. That's the building in the 1900s. That's in 2002, before that wicked lady came in. And that's today. Hasn't changed much. Color a little bit, but that's about it. It's a magnificent edifice, and it's the oldest building, I believe, in Araby, which gives it some additional credit there. This is Edwin Main Roy Jr., Mr. E. M. Roy, who we all know and love, in his abode, in his comfortable chair. The voice, it began here in newspapers with the Eagle from 1877 to 1888. When the Beagles, Eagle stopped publishing, it became the St. Bernard Progress till 1889. William Roy worked for that. The first issue of The Voice was in January 11th, 19, 1890, which means January will be 130 years. How impressive is that? Circulation today is about 3,000. And it's extensive readership, because since Katrina, a lot of people have left the community, but they still get The Voice. They want to know what's happening in their community. And now that it's being digitized, I think it reaches even further. These are actual published copies. When you go online, there's no telling how much an article or a newspaper will be shared. And it's a true reflection of what life is in St. Bernard Parish. It's the third oldest family newspaper in, this, in Louisiana. That says something. It was purchased by William Roy in 1890. 
When he passed away in 1948, Edwin Roy became publisher, and upon his passing in 1972, E.M. Roy, Jr. took command. He was assisted by his wife, Judy, his sister, Maisie. I'll have to talk about Maisie in a little bit. That's my sweetheart. And uh, several other helpers over the years. I remember Louise used to do all the typing. When I first started writing, my own experience there going off is a little bit of, an, of a, a history of newspapers. I used to write it by hand on legal paper and pencil and bring it to the voice on Sundays. And uh, Maisie would proofread it, as always. And uh, Louise would type it in. And then from there, we went to me writing it and going by fax machine. And from there, Em and I transitioned to trying to get our computers to talk to one another with the, by telephone line. And then email came along, and it's been email ever since. The Roy family, this is William Frederick Roy, born in 1870. He dies in 1948. He died New Year's Day after getting the paper out. Now, is that the way an editor should go? Think about it. He was a state representative and president of the Louisiana Press Association for two terms. Willie Roy finished school, began work as a typesetter for the St. Bernard Progress. He earned 50 cents a week. Imagine that, working 12 hour days, six days a week. Setting type. He later got $3, whoa, that's a significant raise now, but imagine $3 a week. In December 89, the Progress went out of business, so in January, Willie opened up the St. Bernard Voice, okay? And he was 19 years old when he did it as a young entrepreneur. His first employee, he paid 25 cents a week because he was trying to get a newspaper off the ground. This here, we believe, I was talking to Yam, he provided me with this, is the, uh, I have a pointer? That's a bell tower, belfry, and at one time possibly a lighthouse that became the voice building. If you look at the shape of it, that's what the original voice building was. Here's a close up of it. So if you look at it, you can see it's got some of the architectural lines of what the voice was. Okay. Then it moved. It was originally located on the Mississippi River, but then they had to move the levee, so the Corps came out, not Corps, came out and made a move all the buildings. So the voice was packed up and moved and brought to Mealy Street. Okay, and uh, but the DA's office, the fire department was moved as well. And Mr. Roy purchased two lots on Mealy Street. I think he paid $100. And uh, from St. Peter's, he brought them to Mealy Street. And then the Aubrey brothers still did it. I know in Natchez, they moved a house with mules and logs. So I have a feeling that's probably how they moved this one. Just rolled it on over, okay? That was in November 1912. As I said, it's the oldest building in Araby. This is William Roy and his wife, Mary Alice Roy. Edwin Main Roy, 1905 to 1975. He was president of the Louisiana Press Association for one term, and he began working at the age of 13. It's truly a family business. When his father died, Edwin took over, and for 28 years, he was the editor and ran it until his passing in 1975. And now we have E.M. Roy taken over in 1975. And uh, as I'm sure Judy will attest to, every week, no vacations. Because if you go back, E.M. would have to go to everything, take pictures of everything, bring them back to the dark room, develop the pictures, then take the pictures and run them through the offset machine. In the meantime, putting together the paper. You know, the walls were covered with the paper. You'll see a picture a little later on as to how it works. You can kind of see it in the background there. It looks like an explosion in a pastry factory or something. It's just all over the place, you see. So you have to have your deadlines by midday Wednesday, and everything had to be set in place, okay? Let's see. This shows you what a family business it is. That's EM's grandfather and father coming out the voice. As EM kidded, his dad was probably telling his dad, there's EM as a child. So you got three generations of the St. Bernard voice in one quick film that was probably shot out, imagine around 1950 EM, something like that, judging on your age. Looking at the paper, he's probably telling him, look, you made a mistake here, son. You gotta, <laughs> I want that corrected, you hear me? Now go about your business. All right, all right, Dad, I'll see to it. That boy better straighten up, I'm telling you. 
And here's the little one. That's the whole family. You saw Maisie in there? Okay, there's my girl, Maisie. I was telling some members of the family, I had so much fun with Maisie over the years because I used to write my articles and bring them to her. And then she'd prove freedom and let me know and would be talking on the phone, make corrections. But then as things got along, we got to the email world. I'd send them to them by email. And I used to write the most outrageous articles. I mean, I would just say exactly what was on my mind and shoot them to her. And I'd wait about an hour and a half. And I'd call her back, say, what you think, Maze? She said, you know, we can't print this. <laughs> I said, no, but it's fun to read, wasn't it? She goes, <laughs> She goes, yeah, it was. <laughs> she goes, well, you're sending a real thing. I said, it's coming to you now, darling. It's coming to you now. But we had an argument that went on for 20 years. If anybody knew Maisie, she was all about grandma. And the argument we had was that. Does the period go outside the quotes if it's just the word or inside the quotes? She says, no, it goes inside. I said, no, it goes outside. This went on for 20 years. I knew she was right, but I wasn't going to admit it. It ruined the argument. <laughs> so it went on. So in this article, my last chance, I put it where I wanted to put it and not where she says it belongs and where I know it does belong. <laughs> so that's just a little homage to my girl. She was amazing. Just look at that smile. Responsibilities of local papers are extensive. <coughs> Oops. It's not moving. Did it die? Quinn. Yep, there we are. So you can see they have minutes. People don't understand what an official journal is. An official journal's responsibility is to handle all the legal work for the entire parish, and they have to get it right, totally right. Dates right and everything. Bids come in, you got to have it down right. Minutes of meetings have to be put in. So the minutes of all public meetings, that's just back then the police jury or the parish council, you got water boards, school boards, you name it, the boards, you got it. No, legal notifications have to be in there. Those have to be specified by time. You can't miss it. Public bids, notification of ordinances and public meetings, death notices, cover stories about important events, public and private announcements, weddings. People don't like it when you forget to announce their wedding. Okay? Announcements of sheriff's auctions. That's really important, especially when it comes to land transactions and police reports. In addition, important news stories, vehicle providing advertising, wedding and death notices, editorial comments, hello, <laughs> letters to the editor, I got some of those, special features, information about social activities, and photographs of important events. All of this is put together every week and put out. In by what, Thursday night, I think, EM, you have it ready, and you have it at the post office Thursday evening or Friday. Then he gets a day of rest, then he's back at it again for another six days over the weekend. Changes in technology. In the early days, they had what were called sticks, which you would put the letters in. And imagine this, you had to write it in reverse, upside down, from right to left. That's a perfect test for somebody in a DWI, right? <laughs> <laughs> Write your name in reverse and upside down. Can't do it. Go, go to jail. No go. Lock it into a frame. You make a page, and the page is assembled. This is the original way in the old Washington Press. Then you do it, and you take all the letters out, put them back in the little boxes, and do your next page, and print your next pages. Pictures. If you go back, you'll find the pictures are almost always the same. So, God, these people just didn't age. No, they were etched into a metal plate. So you use the same pictures, the same plate over and over again because it was expensive. You figure if people are working three or four dollars a week, five dollars for a picture is a lot of money. You're going to use it over and over again. And so they did. So that's what a picture would look like on one of those wooden plates. These are the individual letters. And if you notice, one thing that was nice about there's a groove on the top. If you look at it when you put the whole thing together, if all the grooves are up, you got it right. If any groove's not, that letter's upside down. So, so there was a little bit of a handy helper there. It's not quite spell check, but it's something anyway. This is what a stick looks like. So you hold the thing in your hand with your thumb, and you drop the letters in, and spell what you need to spell, and you drop those pieces in. So you imagine how time-consuming 
it is to put together an early newspaper. That's the old Washington Press. It's a picture of one. You take the sheet, you put the sheet on top of the plate, you ro roll it in there, you press the thing, that's why it's called a press, by the way, and you raise it up, and you take the sheet out, and you let it dry, you put the next one in, and you work your way down there, then you take everything apart, disassemble it, make your next page, put it all together, and print it again. It's very laborious. Other printing things, early days, each individual letter had to be put in. This here, EM, I think you told me that was what you called the lumberyard or something, which is when you put a picture in, the thickness might not be the same, so you had to wedge it with little pieces of paper to make sure everything's level. These were little blocks of wood, so between paragraphs or sentences, you'd have to put little blocks of wood to separate everything, because when you put it all together, you locked it in so it wouldn't move. Otherwise, if you moved all the letters fell out, you'd be a little depressed. So you could see, maybe that's where the term press comes from, depressed. I had just thought of that. Anyway, these are cast letters. That's the next stage when you start getting into linotype. That's what the linotype letters look like. But again, upside down, reversed. Then in 1963, they went from the press to offset printing. Don't ask me to explain it. I've read it. I tried to understand it. I can't. You know, it's, it's a pretty involved process. But they were so thrilled with it here, and they came up where they had the picture of E.M. and his father when they got the offset machine in 1963. That's what changed the whole process. That's the old press. Then after you did the press, this was a Heidelberg press that they used. They used to do invitations, business cards, and things like that. That was a secondary press that was located in the back of the voice. This is the folding machine that folded the newspaper. So after you assembled it, you put it together. It was all folded up. And after they were folded, they were bound in stacks to bring them to the newspapers. And he had another machine, which I don't have in there, where you printed out all the labels. And you printed the labels, put the labels on it, then you had to separate them by zip code, bind them in the binding machine, and go to each post office and drop them off. Then the other newspapers, you went to the different stores and dropped it off store. So you're also doing all your own delivery besides putting out the paper, if you can imagine the legwork involved in that. This was EM's darkroom. The thing now, people are totally spoiled nowadays with digital photography. I know I am. I had a darkroom. You take all kinds of pictures. You don't really know what you had until you got in the darkroom and developed it. And if something went wrong, there wasn't a whole lot you could do about it. Oops, I missed the wedding. <laughs> so people aren't happy with that or any type of a picture. So EM took all kinds of pictures. So I'm sure it was the same EM for you as it was for me. It was kind of scary when you put the developer and everything in that little container, shook it up, and then dumped it out, put the stop in, dumped it out, put the fix in, dumped it out, put the wash in, dumped it out. And you held your breath as you open up and pull it out. And went, Is it there? You go, hey, I got a picture. Then you had to develop the picture. All you got is a negative. Right? You have to take. So all that work went in on top of everything else else that had to be done. New technologies from the early days of hand inserting, now digital photography comes out and replaces the darkroom. You throw it up on a computer screen, you adapt it, adjust it the way you want, trim it, crop it, whatever you want, you got it in the computer database. Okay. Margin of safety, because you know immediately you have a good picture, because it's true. You take the picture, you look at it, okay, good. You also can take a whole pile of pictures, because erase them. It's not like film. Film's not that cheap. There they are, brother and sister. Maisie, working away as she always was behind that desk. And if you look at the background, that's how they did it. All along the walls were clips, and as each page was done, it was hung up until the whole newspaper was assembled. Then it was run through the machines, the offset machines, and printed out. So you'd go in there and you can see the paper. I used to laugh when I'd go visit him because the floor is covered with clippings because they take the piece and take it with his razor knife on a glass uh, table and trim it and brush the paper, <laughs> trim it, brush the stuff off. So the whole paper around him looked like a snowstorm. This is the Dixie Roto that was done on EM. Some of you all might remember Dixie Roto. Yes? No? Yeah. Yay! It's the old people like me in the audience. Then, of course, we get to the modern technology, computers. Everything's done in a computer. You lay out the whole thing on the screen, the newspaper, and you print it out. You send it off. Yeah, I guess you send it electronically off to the printer, and it's done that way. You know, so the old day of all the hand carrying and all that is gone now. Editing is so much easier. My articles, I would imagine, are sent to him by email as an attachment. You open it up, you throw it in there, and you size it and put it in. So much easier. 
And that's still, though, if you look, here's along the walls. This is right before the storm. All the pages are laid out. So you still have to cut them out and put them out. There's E.M. Hart at work. All the pictures. I hope they didn't lose all those. Did you, E.M.? No? Good. Because that was... There's so many pictures. You think about that. 130 years of photographs. It's almost like a movie of St. Bernard, if you put them all together. Inside the voice, we had everything. It's the social bits by Maisie. Used to love to read everything that was going on. There's Judy Roy. Christina Vella. That's another lady I dearly love. Incredibly talented woman. She taught here in the St. Bernard School Board. She taught at Tulane. She wrote so many books. The last one she wrote sadly hasn't been published yet. I was proofreading it for her when she passed. It's on Ataturk of Turkey. Amazing work. This is her with her book here on George Washington Carver, which is another great work. Great loss to everyone. Financial tips. Paul Perez used to have his financial articles in there. Well, we think we know who that gentleman is. Sans beard, you know. Scotty LeBlanc. Remember that? I used to do the, the fun run to benefit community playground projects. There's this guy. I look like a crypt. like it belongs in a post office, doesn't it? <laughs> I think that's where I got it. And the Christmas issue, every year at Christmas time, people, all the politicians and everybody and big business people would put out the, be the Christmas issue. Recognize any of these people? Emil Ruder, Najolia, what you got? Look at these people. Val Reese, look at this collection. Good Lord. Roy Gonzalez. I mean, but if you look back at the voice, it's, it's, a, snap, it's a time capsule of St. Bernard Parish. It's just amazing. J. Claude Merrow. Everybody's wishing you. Jack Raleigh. Sammy Nunez. Frank Patty. Pedofield. St. Germain. Vetter. Look at all these names. The Bop team. They had parks. Remember Eddie Bop? I used to give Eddie Bop a hard time, too. I used to say, Eddie, let me get this straight. So you're a politician. He was a pharmacist. So I said, you're a politician, a drug dealer, and a banker? <laughs> Just trying to get that straight in my mind, you know. You sleep at night, right, Eddie? He was another guy that was just a class act. And of course, Mr. Sidney Torres, remember him? God. He gave me tremendous advice throughout that whole charter, home rule charter process. We used to meet at Anthony's period. He'd have lunch, I'd have lunch, and he'd sit down together and we'd talk about what I can do, what I can't do, and what would kill me and what wouldn't. This is an editor, a voice of a poem. Social scene, Katilia, 1967. I'm gonna get in trouble for this one. She's staring at me with daggers in her eyes. That's my lovely wife. <laughs> Don't you put that up there, done. <laughs> Look at the prices. My God, you know, it's hard to make it out, but you got cane syrup is, what, 19 cents. Coffee is 29 cents. Really? I mean, if you look at these prices, it's like, God, no wonder you could live on 50 cents a week. Because that still only gives you two cups of coffee or two pounds of coffee, but, you know, things have changed. Good rice. I don't know if they sell bad rice, but they got good rice up there. Important stories? Trap of war. The newspaper covered everything. Limburg, landing here tomorrow. Look at the date. This is April Fool's Day. So, he did an, yeah, so he did another one what with Pancho Villa one time. I mean, he would just say, y'all ready to swallow this hook, <laughs> you know? So he'd throw it out there. Man, Lindbergh was here? No, man. <laughs> but it was fun reading. It's like my columns to eat to Maisie. The 1927 levee blast. Now this is getting really interesting because we know what happened in 1927. The city was about to go under, so they made a decision to take the pressure off the levees that blow up St. Bernard. So they took out the levee in Poydras, okay? 
to pull for all the banking interests. Sadly, they were told they didn't have to because the levy of Bayou de Glacius up north Louisiana would break and take the pressure off, but I think it was for stock reasons or whatever, they insisted on doing it to send a message to Wall Street that we're gonna do something, and so what about the people in St. Bernard? So everybody in the lower part of the parish just about lost everything they had, and the damage to the city never happened. Ian Roy was refused the right to cover the story. They wouldn't let him go down there and cover it, okay? Well, he wrote about it. <laughs> he found out what was going on. River the stage will break previous records. Ships that anchor in river are a source of danger. Carnival on the levee severed. Now, he wrote this article because they wouldn't let him go down there to take the pictures of it to see what was going on. He heard it happen. What happened was they blew it, but they didn't use enough dynamite. So they had to keep coming back several times, and finally they got it gone. What happened was, since they wouldn't let him go down there, he wrote that it was blown because he was told it was. He published that, but then after he published it, found out it wasn't, but then it was blown before the next issue came out, but he still, this shows integrity. He still wrote a column apologizing for misleading the citizens at the time. He wrote it, it wasn't blown when he was told it was. Try that one on the New York Times, okay? Man-made break spreading. Blasting continues for 12 days. They blew on that thing until they got that levee broken. Fur industry is hard hit. 50 Orleanians to be sued. This is another one. So anyway, go back on that one if I can. So if this, the whole area was destroyed down there. And a strange thing happened to me before Katrina. I was in my office and Alberta Lewis came up to me with a box. He said, look, I got this box of stuff. If you want to look through it, I found it in the attic. I said, great. So I go through it. It's a bunch of four by six black and white negatives. And I start looking at them. I said, what? And there was a little envelope that they were in that was August 27th, 1927. It was the flood. So I took the pictures, and they had some prints. And I laid the negative with the print, negative with the print. And I realized, my god, there's a whole bunch of more negatives. So I set up my dark room and did contact prints. I think there was 118 photographs of houses that went underwater. This photographer, I think, took a picture of every house down the road underwater. For whatever reason, I don't know, but he documented it, okay? This here, Huey Long becomes governor, and he gets in trouble when he f decides to put a tax on Standard Oil. So Standard Oil moves to have him impeached. And this is Standard Oil's letter to the people and all the newspapers also in a voice saying, we have nothing to do with this. <laughs> their fingers are dripping in blood, but we have nothing to do with this. <laughs> you know? So anyway, that's their official statement saying that they, they separate themselves from the assassination of Caesar. Of course, uh, Huey survived it with a round robin, which is a story in and of itself. Florida Walk, how many times have we heard about the Florida Walk? For 99 years. 1930, they started talking about the Florida Walk. I don't know if that's the expressway that comes over, it's supposed to intersect with Paris Road. It's almost 100 years later, we still don't have it. That's progress, the Louisiana style. May 24th, 1930. The Gulf Outlet. It was called the Tidewater Channel. The original ideas predate the Civil War, but they pushed it, and in 1957, they started, okay? And so what happened, Mr. Roy was upset. He was deeply concerned what was gonna happen, so in every paper he had is St. Bernard Parish doomed, where he took a section and he wrote about, this is what's gonna happen to you guys if they build this thing, okay? And each time he did it, he decides they were supposed to put locks on it. They never did. Instead of putting locks, you might have been able to keep some of the water out. That was the plan, or we'll protect you with locks. Ever seen any locks? No. 500 feet wide, 3,500 feet wide by the time Katrina came through in sections. So he discusses this, that it's supposed to help our uh, industrial growth. It's not going to do it. He now raises issues with traffic congestion, causing him a cutting parish road. This was our main way in and out. Y'all going to take the road down. How many of y'all remember the pontoon bridge? <laughs> No air conditioning, wind is down, mosquitoes. <laughs> and then a train. <laughs> it was a trifecta. <laughs> so, 
And he starts talking about every serious issue that the channel will cause, fishing and hunting, the wetlands. We lost 80,000 acres of cypress forest with the, with, through saltwater intrusion, which also opened the door. Because I thought it was a fitting, I mean, a, a fitting opening dedication to it, because when they dedicated it, Betsy came in and the water came up and did exactly what Mr. Roy said it was going to do and flooded everybody. They're about potential loss of land. Here he is talking about the wetlands loss. Fazanville. I don't know if you all remember Fazanville, but that was a community that was in the uh, battlefield. And what happened in 1963, they were preparing for the 1965 150th anniversary. So a woman by the name of Martha Robinson in town got the refineries to put up money. Well, actually, it was uh, the railroads and Kaiser Aluminum, but the, and they got the, the park. The idea was to join the monument and the battlefield is one piece of land with the, with the cemetery. But there was a strip of land in the middle that belonged to a black community called Fazanville. And so they basically, Park Service in 1963, went through an act of Congress and had it removed. So they were there for 100 years. And they were obliterated in 1964. The last houses were knocked down. And it was done under the signature of John Kennedy in October, about a month before he was assassinated. Kennedy signs the Chalmette Bill, 1963. Fazanville Road closed. The lock project, the new locks. Be very mindful of what's happening there. It's going to kill us, as far as I'm concerned, because I've gone to some of the meetings, and it's terrible. Corps of Engineers has determined that the locks connecting the coastal waterway have to be replaced. But if you look at their plan, it's great if you have a tugboat and a barge, but if you live in St. Bernard Parish or Lower Nine, you're not going to get across that canal because the way they've arranged this thing, they're going to keep the St. Claude Bridge low. They're not going to raise it. So that means every time toes go through, they have to open it. And I was talking to a riverboat captain. He says, you don't understand. The way they arrange it, it'll be open for over an hour at a minimum. He says, because they say, well, you can line the tug. He says, no. He says, when you line the tug up, I need at least a length of a tow between me and the next tow so that I can control those barges because I got to move at a certain speed and need so much room to stop. So if they say three tows, make it six. That's the length you need. At the speed we go at, that'll take over an hour for everybody to get through. So every time the bridge opens, it'll be open for an hour. Okay? We have to fight this or at least make them aware that we have rights to a comedy. Well, we're in the approach. I said, when I argue with I said, the approach is long enough. Hell, it's longer than, it's, than it's, uh, the Claiborne Bridge. You got enough room to make a high rise bridge? We can't do that. Why? Well, because we have passed new regulations on slope. I said, change the paperwork, for God's sakes, you know? Governments, I don't know. Can't say it. Ed Duty, family's here. He was the man who was leading this charge in 2002. Just like Mr. Roy did with the uh, canal, with the Tidewater Canal, we call Mr. Go, he was leading this charge. His sons are still fighting that battle, if I'm not mistaken, you know, doing what they possibly can to protect the parish. There are people out there working hard to make things done. This continues to this day. The Big Lock Accommodation, this is one of his columns. He's an engineer, by the way. Threats to the St. Bernard voice, a major fire broke out in the industrial building across the street. The intensity threatened the paper's building. Talking to him, he had a hose hosing down in front of the building because the heat was so hot, the, the smoke was coming off the wood of his building. It was reaching kindling temperature until finally they got the fire under control and the fire department came out and hosed down his building to take the pressure off of EM. There's the fire, which was easy to take that picture. You just stepped out the door, right? <laughs> right there, not often the story comes to you. <laughs> Anybody recognize this guy? Tommy Stone. He's always been there. Great man. I love Tommy. Hurricane Katrina. St. Bernard Parish, like the rest of the parish, was devastated by the storm. For the first time in his long history, the voice was silent for a few weeks. Betsy, everything they always wrote. This is something that knocked the ground out for most everybody. But he still got the paper together. After just a few weeks, he got it together. And he published The Voice. This is all the trash and everything pulled out from the front. You can kind of see the X on the door there. Remember how famous X is. Why they put it on brick is beyond me. But anyway, they did. So The Voice today, this is EM now in his offices. This is Norris Babin and Dale Bonoir. 
co-publishers. What happened was, it's tough on AM, putting things together. These two gentlemen came to his assistance. He was getting the newspaper run through the printing offices and bringing it back and distributing it. They helped out tremendously, and age gets to all of us. And then the EM just needed some help. They offered to purchase the newspaper and make him editor emeritus. He sadly had to agree, but he did, and they've been wonderful people as, as partners in this newspaper. They've been great. So Norris and Dale, yeah? Please. <laughs> he doesn't know how to spell it. And you notice why his kids went, no, 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 Dad. You know, <laughs> we know what your life's been like. So it kind of goes with the turf, doesn't it? It's got its own little curse, <laughs> so to speak. That was great. So the Plaquemines Gazette purchased the St. Bernard Voice in December 2008. Interesting story, the Voice struggled to recover. Norris volunteered to help publish the newspaper. Because of the long recovery process and personal reasons, Roy decided to turn the paper over to Mrs. Babin and Benoit. He maintained positions publisher emeritus. The new Voice, we're not handset anymore. <laughs> I can't spell backwards either. I have a lot of time spelling forward. It's changed full color. We've got full color now. It used to sometimes just be once in a while. The way color worked in the old days, right? If there was a politician going on in a political ad and they had money and they would wanted a color ad done, that page could be color, right? So everybody would jump on that page to get color. <laughs> so they'd voice it, one page of color. It was great. Photographs are obviously more easily put in. Changes in font. Online editions, you can get it online. Emails, additional columnists have been added. More information. The Gazette. The St. Bernard Voice are now sister newspapers. E.M. Roy, Mr. Jimmy Delery. I think I need a new picture. I'm older than that. <laughs> but I might keep it there. Anyway, <laughs> the Justice of the Peace, suits filed, St. Bernard arrests. You have the whole assortment. It is still and remains the official journal of St. Bernard Parish. So in conclusion, local newspapers provide an important service. They keep residents informed about breaking news and act as a repository for history. Thank God we have some of the voices left. E.M. lost his files in microfilm. The parish lost theirs. So we didn't have any copies of it. We do now, thanks to Jack Rowley. He put up the money to the DA's office to have the Hill Library give us the St. Bernard voice on microfilm. I have it, and what I'm trying to do is find a way of getting it digitized with a searchable PDF and accessible to anybody who wants it just by going to the site and clicking on it. We're working on that. But it's kind of out of my realm. I don't understand technology that well. I'm afraid I'm going to go with something. So I said, you know, you should have. And that's the quest. That's the argument I don't really want to get into. So if anybody's got some expertise in that field, I'm all ears. St. Bernard is blessed to be served by one of the oldest family newspapers in Louisiana, the St. Bernard Voice. And it still goes on. Thank you so much. <laughs>